And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. Coming to us straight coming to us straight fr coming to us straight from Balsamic Moon Games as the the double-headed monster cr who is currently developing Witches of Midnight. We have Gavin the GM in the red corner and we and we have the Wildwood Witch Andrea in the blue corner. How you two doing tonight? Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, these corners are very well uh uh, developed. They're they're beautiful. <laughs> yeah, just just remember just remember, mind your rabbit punches, touch gloves, and come out fighting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll touch more than gloves. Oh, <laughs> hey, phrasing. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to say. <laughs> uh. So, it's tradition around here with newcomers to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, I'd like. I'd like you to walk me through. I'd like you two to walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yeah. So I first started playing games with Gavin when we first met, uh, way back in the day. Now, fourteen. Yeah, fourteen, fifteen years ago. Yeah. Um. The the first game we played was a werewolf the apocalypse game. And um, I was a painfully shy person who uh, was barely able to speak to anybody that, uh, even people that I liked. <laughs> so uh, role-playing games actually helped me come out of my shell a lot, helped me get over a lot of social anxiety, um, playing with a group of people who were also very welcoming and nice at a table every week. It lets you practice all those really important skills and uh, yeah. I have just decided that that is a super valuable thing that I would like to be a part of and share with other people when I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, everybody's nice at the table, except for the dice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or the dice bots uh, oh. these days, but yeah. They oh. they hate my dice bots. I'm a <laughs> computer programmer by trade, so I'm always writing all the tools and everything for games. So, uh, you're, so. so you're familiar with the programmer's drinking song? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I am. 99 little bugs in the code. 99 bugs in the code. You take one I... down, you patch it around. 287 bugs in the code. <laughs> yeah. That does sound about right. Especially once you get, you know, uh, more than one developer working on something, then it just explodes. I, yeah. um, I've, I've had, I've had to be the peacemaker in some of those situations. <laughs> and I think I think the only reason I was able to get away with it was because everybody was five foot nothing, and I was, and I'm, and I'm not, because <laughs> um, I, th I think in I think in one case I I I had said to someone if you don't if you don't if you don't stop acting up I'm going to I'm going to have you go through stretching practice, <laughs> which, to put things in perspective on why that'd be a problem. Um, one of my one of my relatives is a gymnast, and I ju wow. I just set I just send them over to her and say, and say, um, give give them five minutes and be gentle with them. <laughs> you know, kid gloves, but made from real kids. No, <laughs> Zamish gloves. <laughs> like if I if I, because I've 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 had to work with very flexible people on in that regard and um. Yeah, it only t it only takes one it only takes one instance w to get the message across. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, because unfor fortunately and unfortunately, not everybody can do the splits. No. No. <laughs> but some people we're we're just built different. Wrong, <laughs> but different. <Yep. laughs> but, but um, it is fu it is funny that you br that you bring up werewolf since I um. I had to explain. I had to explain why I preferred the New World of Darkness version of Werewolf versus, versus the old, and it was because, and may, it was because in in my experience, Apocalypse had what I call a Moriarty problem. 
Mm, uh, yeah. The uh, villains are too smart, too well the organized. Are always the no, same. It's uh, the it's the fact that everything has to tie somehow to the worm. Yeah. yeah. That's that's what I mean by the Moriarty problem because gotcha. in Sherlock Holmes somehow Moriarty was directly or indirectly responsible with all of the cases he was work that Holmes was yeah. working on. Uh, I don't know. I when I run it, I tend to try to throw in some sort of like false leads. Um, have them go off on some adventures and find out that it's not connected to the worm, like yeah. really challenge their perceptions of what's going on. It's that dang weaver instead. Yeah. Oh yeah, the weaver was my the weaver was actually my main villain of the three and a half year long yeah. weekly campaign I ran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was just a bit of an annoyance that so much so yeah. that so yeah, much was focused yeah. on Gaia and the worm, which one with which if you're do if you're doing a Lord of the Rings style um thing um, absolute right. good and absolute evil. That's fi that's fine, yeah. but where but werewolf doesn't want to be doesn't want to be that, but it still wants yeah. to have that absolute good and absolute evil. Yeah, I think as a non-religious person, one of the things that drew me to werewolf specifically was that uh, it plays with religion, and because I was getting to that point where. I could, even though I had a lot of religious trauma, I could start to play with it again. And that that sort of literality of the worm, the wild, and the weaver, uh, you know, uh, the way they bounce off of each other, to me, it was really helpful to, like, treat that as black and white and then just break off little chunks and do other fun things yeah. with it. But I agree with you. The, the core book does not teach you how to do anything no, you but you have to be uh, your own kind of creative to do that yeah which i've never i've never been a f i've never been a fan of that kind of swim damn it thinking uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah imagine imagine how boring star wars would be if it was if it was all jedi and sith all the damn time mm -hmm. yeah that oh yeah I that's mean, the best analog uh, i can I can come up with. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people have have uh, bowed out of that whole thing because of that. Uh, it, luckily, yeah, the the ecosystem for uh, telling other stories has got a lot yeah. better over the last two or three years. So that's um, amazing. I do I I do remember um, um, Ralph Coster, who when when he was developing Star Wars Galaxies, he was insistent on not having Jedi in the game. <laughs> and his reasoning was it would be an alpha class that everybody would chase. Right. Yeah, for sure. It wasn't until the NGE era that his hand was forced, so he decided mm -hmm. to try and make it as difficult as possible, which worked for about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but how? what was your introduction, Gavin? Uh, so, yeah, I've been... Um, I actually started designing uh, tabletop games when... Uh, I had a favorite Final Fantasy game back in the uh, 80s that, or sorry, early 90s that um, I knew there would never be a sequel to. Uh, so not knowing about tabletop games, um, I designed my own to, as a way of telling a continuing story based off a Final Fantasy game. And it wasn't until about a year and a half later that I actually learned that tabletop role-playing games already existed and <laughs> I had been reinventing the wheel with, uh, I think you mentioned it before, a TI-83 calculator. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we had input all of the, like, battle algorithms and everything into a calculator so we could just input our stats and output whether we hit or not and how much damage we did. And we just used a chessboard for battles. But yeah, so <laughs> that was my start. Um, and then... Uh, I, I would say I got a big resurgence of energy for game development when we started playing uh, World of Darkness a lot more and and uh, branching out into some more indie stuff like uh, Forged in the Dark games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's sort of my through line. Started with video games, as it did with a lot of people. Yeah, which is which is always amu always amusing to me because in my formative years there seemed to be this attitude that it was somehow verboten to be taking notes from video games or fr or from manga even though mm. even though a lot of the stuff in 
the world's most litigious role-playing game is just a hodgepodge of things that its creators happen to like. Oh, yeah. And when it, and video games and TTRPGs, especially the especially the world's most litigious role-playing game, as I call it, um, have it, have a far closer relationship than people think, going all the way back to the seventies. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the ungodly huge Plato systems. <laughs> and th- and then of course and then of course the gold box era and ju- and just everything that SSI had put had put out over the years in general but i s- if i if i had to ha- if i had to hazard a guess as far as the final fantasy that you that um <laughs> that had that had spurred this on it w- given the time frame it was probably known to you as two, but is actually four. That is correct. <laughs> FF four, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, FFIV. Which uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, um, I do think I do think that one ends up ends up falling through the cracks because everybody talks way too much about um six. Which don't get me wrong, I yeah. love six to death, but yeah. Um, I've had I've had the attitude that. When talking about um, video game RPGs from that era, bringing up six or a Chrono Trigger is is kind of the is kind of the basic move. Like, yeah. Like it's it's like it's like if it's like if somebody somebody asked about your about your favorite metal band and you instantly bring up Metallica or Slayer. Yeah. Even if you even if I happen to like those bands, the case yeah. of couldn't you go with a little something a little bit less obvious? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, but the the reason the reason why that one's kind of interesting is because is because of um I have I have stu- I've studied a lot of stuff that um Hiroyuki Ito has contributed to the franchise and the big the big one when it came to 4 was the active time system. Mm. Um yeah. Which apparently he's, and I've talked about this on other streams. The inspiration for that was Formula One and football. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but moreover, he he said he had said that when he was develop when he was developing that system, he had predicted that things would grad would gradually shift towards a more action based affair, and this yeah. was his attempt at moving that along with the technology he had. Yeah, yeah, no, it it's it makes perfect sense, and it was a, a brilliant move. Of course, I turned it off most of the time, but that's just because I was bad. <laughs> As my mentor would often say, "Get more gooder." Yeah, <laughs> I I was uh, at the time I was the person who sat behind the person with the controller and I cheered them on and read all the dialogue. So, well, let, let me make it <laughs> let me make it worse. We got yeah. the easy version. <laughs> there were there were two ver- there were two ver- there were two versions of it easy type and hard type. Gotcha. It wasn't until oh, that's a, right. Yeah. It wasn't the until Japanese the, version with uh, all the extra moves and stuff. All the extra moves and all and all the extra kicking your ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can go through that first boss battle with the Mist Dragon in the in the American version and uh, not even notice that it's counterattacking. Because you just wipe the floor with it, but yeah, I've seen people play the Japanese version for the first time, and it's usually a lot more difficult. I liken it to how um, Mar- the actual Mario Brothers two we didn't we didn't get until All Stars, i.e. the right. lost levels. And having played the NES version of Mario two, I completely understand why, because the game can be a bit of a dick. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, between the. The biggest example is the poison mushroom. In the yeah. NES version, it is obvious you're not supposed to touch it. In the <laughs> NES version, it's a slightly darker mushroom, which yeah. on a CRT TV it could be easy to confuse the two. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Which is oh yeah, and, and that was completely intentional too. <laughs> well, there is there is a difference between bad or incompetent game design and deliberate evil. <laughs> <laughs> When I, I s- hope people know I fall on the deliberate evil side. Well, <laughs> every every GM does, and the di- 
Some people might say, wouldn't, wouldn't stuff like loot boxes or microtransactions count as evil? That is a economic evil. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about evil is what is when a game is intentionally dickish and it's done by people who knew exactly what they were doing. <laughs> um, like, if I had to use another example, maybe the Plutonia experiment from uh, Doom 2. Or I should uh. say from Final Doom. Because mm -hmm. the Casali brothers had basically made that with the intention of, um, give, of giving a new challenge to people who had already played through Doom 2 on Ultra Violence. Uh, and he even outright saying, anyone who complains about it being too hard, um, I have no sympathy. <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's notorious for, the, for these very, very evil um, traps. Yeah. Oh. It's also the reason I don't I don't have much sympathy for people complaining about difficulty if they're playing a Souls game. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what you were getting into. You know what you you know what you were getting in you know what you were getting into, and um, it and it's part of the fun. <laughs> part, part, it's part, part of the fun. Yeah. Part part of the part of the fun and give and ev. And if I'm be if I'm being honest, then the the easy mode argument is all, seems to always be done in bad faith, mm. or or at the very least by people who haven't quite gotten to the second step of how you would do that while still maintaining the themes. Yeah. Which is not as easy. Like I know some might say, "We'll just we'll just do less health." Mm -hmm. Um, that's not. If you're if you're doing less health across the board, then it'd be ver it could be very easy to make comp to make encounters boring. Yeah, for sure. But now, for now, Blades in the Dark obviously started out as a fork of Powered by the Apocalypse, or, or Apocalypse World Engine, or whichever they whichever um, they want to call themselves this week. <laughs> right. Um, but were you familiar with the with the Apocalypse World Engine bef beforehand, or did you jump straight into Blades in the Dark? Yeah, we well, <laughs> amazingly, we actually bounced completely over Blades in the Dark. Uh, we mi we missed the whole PBTA revolution as it was happening because we were so engrossed in our offline games at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we came back, sort of into the community in about the last six or so years uh, we immediately found and fell in love with scum and villainy yeah um mm -hmm. and started playing that on a pretty regular basis so that was our first uh the first thing that got us into forged in the dark i then read everything i could about blades and then we started playing a uh, fistful of darkness <laughs> which is another forged in the dark game mm -hmm. uh so i, I and i've read I've read pretty much every PBTA and Forged in the Dark uh, game that I can get my hands on. Um, so I'm pretty well versed in them now. Uh, but yeah, jumped it at when they were actually um, becoming really popular. Uh, yeah, I'm... Oh. I want... When it comes to the ones that you've di that you've dipped into, I, I wonder if that, if that also includes um, st stuff like um, Beam Saber. Missed Beam, Sa Beam Saber barely, um, but I, our kids are playing Slug Blaster, mm -hmm. which uh, yeah, has bears some similarities. And I, I, w I was on I, w I was on the Google the Google Plus forums when um or the Google yeah. uh, for uh, Blades in the Dark when it was still being tested. So that was my, that, that was my introduction. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember how I. How I got a hold of it, and well, I'm I'm looking through some of the entries that I have, and one of them is a Wusha, um, Forced in the Dark hack called Blades of the Immortals. I don't remember how I, think, I got that. Yeah, I think I have that as a PDF as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and I suppose I suppose one of the one of the more and of course one of the more interesting ones I've talked about on on the show in the past is the second edition of A State. Okay, yeah, yeah. I've I've definitely heard about that one a good bit, mm -hmm. uh, but that actually has not. Uh, I haven't actually put that in front of my eyes yet. Yeah, 
I've heard very good things. So I just remember what actually got us into PBTA to start with. It wasn't uh, Scum and Villainy. It was Burning Wheel. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we, we weren't able to really dig our teeth into it. And when we got a hold of Scum and Villainy and realized that there was sort of a through line there with the uh, underpinnings, then we were able to more understand what was going on. We, we did get a little confused with Burning Wheel. <laughs> uh, we did a little one-shot, and we were like, what? that was interesting, but uh, I don't know if that was a game, but I think we just did it wrong. Um, I <laughs> us- When it comes to Burning Wheel, I'm, I usually tell people to start, to start with Mouse Guard, since that's yeah. a simplified take on it, and I will, I will eternally be salty that we were robbed of a Mouse Guard movie once I saw I that demo footage. Know. It's like that that is in the book of grudges. I will I will not let I will not let that go. Yeah. <laughs> um and some whenever whenever um whenever something gets put into the book of grudges it's, it's not a case of oh just forget it in a week. No, that th- that's staying that, that's staying in there. <laughs> it's it's basically uh death note. Um no. <laughs> no. Well, I the re- I I blatantly ripped I blatantly ripped the concept off from the from the book of grudges that's used by the dwarves in Warhammer. Oh, because yes. okay. Warhammer dwarves are spiteful little fuckers. <laughs> and the book of grudges is every si- every single slight that is that has been put on either all of dwarf kind or or that particular clan. Mm. And every single one of them is to is to be paid back. <laughs> well, no, yeah, it's the records you keep for Festivus. Yeah. <laughs> like imagine, imagine write, imagine writing the writing the name and crime of ev- of everyone who's ever slighted you over the course of say twenty years. Now multiply that a few hundred times over. Yeah. <laughs> That's too much. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna need more pages. Well, the. The book of a lot of them don't run out of pages somehow. Nice. But I did. I normally normally I would ask about an appendix N, but one of the sites that you had that you had sent my way um, certainly certainly gave me pl- gave me plenty to to go with on that. A lot of them, a lot of entries were one were ones that I I kind I kind of predicted. I I would see in this I would see in this concept. There's a few. There's a few that I'm. Cu- I'm curious. What I'm curious. What where um. What brought that? What brought them into the list? Um. One of the big ones was um. Dune. Yeah, we, I actually removed it <laughs> because I did. I thought it might be a little confusing. Our touchstones. Oh, Dune. Uh, yeah, Dune. I I think it was because we it had seen it. So yeah, the Benny Gesserit um, are were definitely an influence. Yeah, and I think I I removed it the other day because I couldn't oh, quite put it yeah I couldn't quite fit it uh, in the layout, and then I realized wait I'm not doing layout yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, it needs to go back in for sure. Yeah, yeah the Benny Gesserit were are, were a huge influence. Uh, they're just amazingly cool. They fit the whole gray area yeah. that we inhabit with Witches of Midnight. Uh, we d- we play in the light a bit, and we play in the dark a bit, but we majorly play in the gray area. Yeah. And the yeah. Bene Gesserit are like the perfect example in modern and sci-fi media to, to capture that. But it is it is interesting that you, that um you br- you brought that we brought up werewolf earlier because when I look at the initial pitch for wit for witches of midnight and the and the primary um pr- the primary players um I, it it definitely seems that you guys are going for that um mo- modern modern yet supernatural under the surface approach yeah uh to a degree we we actually are really trying to bring it above the surface um we we kind of were tired of protagonists especially of world of darkness games having to hide from humanity so 
we tried to write it into sort of the first paragraph of the game book yeah. um, goes through an example of or the reason that witches have come out of the cl broom closet as it were mm -hmm. um, and yeah because we want to see them as part of society rather than as like a it, hidden subculture that's you know not appreciated yeah they are appreciated in some places and less appreciated <laughs> in others uh, but yeah yeah and well, ho well, hopefully, hopefully, we won't be dealing with anything as ridiculous as what you as what you deal with in Mage the Ascension. <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, and as that a... was my first rule when I said, if we're gonna make a game about witches, there would be no mage. <laughs> no mage stuff. No paradox. No. Yeah. No. We did no butt fucking of reality. Yeah. Hey. Now. We we do that, but in in small and intense spurts. We don't make you carry over all these weird, paradoxical issues with you as you play. And we say you do wild magic, it goes wrong. Something bad, something mm -hmm. bad, interesting. badly interesting is going to happen, and and we're gonna deal with it right now. You know. Uh, I, I loved playing with Paradox for a short time, but as soon as we played a game with more characters than just mages in it, it became a massive hassle for everybody else at the table. Mm -hmm. um, so happy to um, shunt that aside. I would say the game definitely pulls a lot more from Werewolf than it does from Mage. Yeah. I mean, it's, the game kind of it started out as a let's put Werewolf into blades and um then we're like you know what let's skip werewolves and just do witches because witches are super cool yeah. yeah and with that in with that in mind uh, the i suppose i suppose this is as, as good a time as any to go to go into how you're how you're going to have magic work within this system because no yeah. matter what anytime you introduce magic into into a system Magic is a narrative blank check. You can do just about anything with it, but I will always argue that just because you can do anything with a concept does not mean you should be able to do everything with it. Yeah, we while it come when it comes to grimoire powers, we a hundred percent agree. Grimoire powers are usually uh, pretty precisely uh, molded around a problem and a solution. Um, but when we get to Wild Magic, it is getting very close to blank check territory, uh, but it's balanced out in really interesting ways based on your character's aspect, heritage, and grimoire. Mm -hmm. So while it looks like a blank check on the outside, once you actually sort of dig into Wild Magic, you find out that there's a lot more nuance in there. Yeah. Um, and you you could literally start out every undertaking with wild magic and just go where that takes you um mm -hmm. if you're not going to do sort of a more heisty style or a more goal oriented uh undertaking yeah and and i think i think you also balance out the wild magic with the fact that using it is going to Attract the attention of of certain powers you don't want to, you you don't want having it on your tail. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And the great thing of we've got three factions that basically are the pseudo governmental organization of mundanes that handle that. And so what that means is that when you're an extremely low tier coven or low circle, uh, you'll get pestered by this certain low tier uh, faction more often. But as you use wild magic and things get worse, you go from having a sort of tier one enemy to having a tier four enemy very, very quickly. <laughs> um, and then if you are causing too much trouble and still managing to avoid that tier four faction, then a tier five faction comes in backing them up and they have a whole different power set. Um, so the things that might have been working for you against the Red Watch might not hold up when you're dealing with the Order directly. Yeah. Would it be fair of me to say that the the use of magic is go is is 
going to is going to be determined through three angles. Um, gr the your choice, the choice of grimoire, the choice of heritage, and um, possibly relationship with Fey. Yeah, that, that's a good way of putting it. I would say, for the vast majority of characters, your relationship with the Fey is going to be uneasy. Um, but for a couple different grimoires, you may either be ignored by the Fey, or you may be actively harassed more by the Fey. Uh, so it's all about how you decide that, um, and that is very grimoire-based. Um, your heritage um, and grimoire might even be tied together, which is another interesting little uh, thing there, and that could get the Fae very interested in you as well. So yeah, lots of different angles that the Fae might come in to start picking apart the little uh, things about your character and using them to create some drama. Mm -hmm. Especially since, whenever I've used Fey or their or their equivalent in campaigns that I've run, I've always I've always helped. There's always been a um, I won't say a rule, but a cent a central a central pillar that I that I work with, and that is, Fey do not make sense. Yeah. <laughs> They will, yeah, if they it will... makes sense, you're, you're doing either... it wrong. <laughs> or, you're tra or you're doing it really right and you're really tricking them. <laughs> well, I look at Fae, I look at Fae the, in the same vein as the elves in Discworld. Mm. That, yeah. they, that they embody they embody chaos. Yeah. In the same way the auditors in Discworld embody order and <laughs> yeah. That is a vast simplification, but be, but that's as best as I'm going to go with because Discworld is a crack fic. <laughs> yeah. We have we have tried really hard to make our fay based more in actual folklore mm -hmm. than um, popular uh, images of them. Yeah, ideas to a, to a degree. Yeah. To a degree. So it's I feel like our fay feel a little bit more substantial than your uh, Tinkerbell. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got different types of fae that interact with the world in very different ways. Mm. Um, but, yeah, the main fae that your characters are going to deal with are very powerful and uh, obviously not in their home world. Uh, they kind of have a habit of warping reality around them wherever they go. Like I said, chaos. And the other yeah. reason I, I brought up the whole fae aren't supposed, aren't supposed to make sense is... Not is not to do some sort of LOL random, although that can certainly be a possibility. <laughs> of some having a, having a fae equivalent of a drunken immortal who just who is just chaos wherever he goes, and even the other fae don't like him. Yeah, we have but, some of those. Yep, yeah, we do. <laughs> but ra but rather that they will do and say things that make absolutely no sense to you or I, but make perfect sense to them. And yeah. and what we and things that we would do make make absolutely no sense to them. Yes. Oh, which is a good a good measure to go around when you're when you're dealing with um when you're dealing with spirits or the like. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think I had I think I had one where his whole where his whole thing was not was not met was staying was staying away from. Was was ha staying away from trees, <laughs> and uh, ev even though, and in that same in that same scene, somebody else is having a conversation about about how beautiful the garden is, and the Fey is ju is just actively repulsed, like they like they're have like they're having to like they're having to look at um having having to look at rot at rotting at. At just a just a rotten and and smell and smelly landfill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which does that? Which does is that going to make is that going to make sense for most people? No, but for, for him it's like, why the hell? Why the hell are you spending that? Are you spending that much time tri trimming the, trimming those things? They're fucking disgusting. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You know, and play, you know, and play with play with that particular concept. One of one other thing I found interesting is you you guys are ch you guys are planning on integrating the your own um ter your own tarot into 
into this game. And I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious how you, I'm curious how you how that's going to be gone about. So the tarot deck is uh, going to be a standard tarot deck that you can use on its own. But the way it integrates into our game is all the major arcana cards can be used to. Um, they're going to represent one of our grimoires. Grimoire. And um, you can randomly pull a card to get the grimoire that you want. You could, you know, what is the grimoire of an enemy we're going to face? You can pull a card. And um, so it works in character creation, and all of the minor arcana cards are going to be based in, like, familiar animals. So you can go through and pull a familiar or um, anything like that. You can also take a, take it in a step closer to the actual tarot and you can pull a, a certain number of card pull to get, you know, your beginning, middle, end kind of uh, story points that you want to generate, and it can help you that way. Yeah. We also have a five-card spread that we used uh, as an example in the quick start uh, for you to quickly generate an undertaking for the characters. So you could pull five cards and do that two or three times, and then at the beginning of a session just say, Hey, so you have a fae who walked up to you on the street and told you about this potential undertaking that you guys could go on. Uh, your and then your character, uh, you know, uh, heard from her contact who she had asked about X Y Z, and they have an undertaking idea for you, you know, and so on. And then you know, are you guys interested in any of those, or do you have another idea that you want to follow up? Um, and so, yeah, you can just pull some cards really quickly and get a lot of uh, situations. Um, we even have tables for uh, generating sort of... If you're just out on the street somewhere and you want to know what to set the scene, uh, you could roll some d6s or pick a couple, a couple cards off your tarot deck and you'd have sort of a scene set for you uh, that you could set your... The beginning of your undertaking, yeah, yeah or a free play scene. So yeah, and yeah. as far as, as far as that kind of pick five, since I since I have a since I keep a deck on my on my desk, um, I'd li I'd like to put I'd like to put that to put that to the test if you don't if you don't mind. Yeah, let me pull that up real quick. That's so, awesome. Are we? I'm assuming we're using the whole deck. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think that is the case. Okay, yes. I will. I will give you. I will give you five cards, and I'd like. I'd like you to. Um, I like. You, and I'd like you to improvise the result. Yeah. So the right, first we'll is the Eight of Wands. All right. One sec. I need to pull up my tables. Tables. <laughs> Can't do it without them. Here we go. So, you ready for the you ready for the, for what's left? Got it. That was the eight of eight of wands. Eight of wands. Mm -hmm. All right. Next is the seven of cups. Seven you, of cups. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, third card is death. <laughs> nice. <laughs> It's my favorite card in every deck. Yep. Um, fourth card is the Ten of Swords. Okay. And the fifth card is the Hierophant. Okay. Hey, my least favorite card. <laughs> really? Yeah, I've always... Take that call. Oh. All right, Andrea's going to be hopping out for just a moment. No worries. Yes, we have children. But those are those are the f those are the five that I that I I grabbed, and I just shuffled the deck and just grabbed the top five. Yeah. So. Okay. So from the first card, the Eight of Wands, your uh, contact or the person who gives you the job is a bartender from was the second card 
the Ten of Swords? Um, or was that the last card? Second card was Seven of Cups. Okay. The faction that's giving you the quest through this bartender is House of the Ram. They're like the TST of uh, our game world. They're uh, the a, a satanic faction a that uh, kind of rocks. And let's see, then what? Death? Mm-hmm. It's a Baba Grimoire. <laughs> yeah. Death is 13. Okay. Your job is to strong arm someone. Mm -hmm. And the last one was the Hierophant? The, that, no, death yeah. was the third one. The fourth okay. was the Ten of Swords. All right. Uh, the fourth gives you a complication is that there are other agents working at the same location that you'll be going to but have opposing goals mm -hmm. and, then and the, last, the last was the hierophant which is five the hierophant isn't that zero five mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know okay. off the top of my head. and the faction that you are strong arming is Destiny Research Group. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, they're a pharmaceutical company that does uh, under-the-table experimentation on witches, especially wild witches, uh, in order to supposedly uh, cure mundane diseases. Mm -hmm. but so yeah, we have a bartender who approaches you about a job for a group of Satanists, uh, and they, they want you to beat up Destiny. They Research. want you to beat up some of the scientists from Destiny Research Group, uh, but at the same time, a there are other agents working at the location with similar goals to you. Is uh, is the complication? Mm -hmm. Although it might be more fun to make uh, the goals at odds. Maybe uh, they heard that uh, House of the Ram was trying to pull something, and uh, so they have some extra security when you head there. Yeah. Either, either either that or I, I'm the type of person who would who would spring that who would spring who would spring that complication at the worst time and create a Mexican standoff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's funny, actually. I remember you guys going up against the Destiny Research Group and meeting another group of witches in there. I, uh, yeah, maybe. I think so. I and the gag, the gag that I often use whenever I do those kind of Mexican standoffs in these situations is both is both sides being given half of being given half of the story. So so the <laughs> so each of them th each of them thinks that each of them are they're technically on the same side. It's just right. that they're it's just that they're given info to make that makes them think that they're not. <laughs> um, yeah. I feel like that and, happened in a better run game too. <laughs> and um, as as an aside, one thing that I feel needs to be normalized when it comes to discuss when it comes to discussions of certain archetypes is why have we not had it that the that a bartending association is a front for a, for a guild of alchemists? <laughs> yeah, we did do that. Yeah, I mean that was like our nineteen twenties game. That is true. Yeah, we we. Uh did a sort of um, we, we also stream the game mm -hmm. on, a, on a relatively regular basis we've got like 60 streamed episodes under our belt and about 75 in total play tested but uh, yeah we did a little mini series set in the 1930s and, era. Yeah, and uh, the Fae were running the actual speakeasies because they could create pocket realms to bring people into um, so the speakeasies could be in a different place every night, mm -hmm. and they had the witches making the actual alcohol um, and making it extra special, if you will. Um, and yeah, so we had a whole um, witches turning against their fey masters um, and trying to shut down the uh, the system. And yeah, it was really, really interesting. Yeah, I've... They did not end up make, meeting their goal. They ended up getting trapped in Arcadia for a bit. Um, yeah. I've I've drawn I've drawn upon 
where I've drawn upon where I where I come from because I'm in I'm in Minnesota and there's and there and there's microbrews and pub crawls for di for days. <laughs> I've yeah. done I've done I've done pub I've done pub crawls at least once. Zombie pub crawls are always a thing in October. Mm -hmm. Along along with along with Oktoberfest, but that's kind but that's kind of a given. Yeah. But every but everybody ha everybody has that particular local brew that that they're going to favor and some sometimes disagreements can happen the same way disagreements can happen between <laughs> Texas and and Oklahoma and Kansas City about who makes the better barbecue. <laughs> and oh, South Carolina. I've, yeah, we're <laughs> we're on the East Coast, and we have our own different three states that fight about that. But yeah, yeah. same same argument, different states. And I've I've run campaigns where di where rival where rival alchemist guilds, i i e bar i e um bartenders, um are f are fighting o are fighting over who ma over who makes the better ones, and there's you they usually end up hi they usually end up hiring agents to make sure that the fighting doesn't get too out of hand. <laughs> yeah, and if that if that sounds like that if it sounds like the player characters are borderline referees in that situation, uh, I'd say I'd say less referee and more in and more enforcer. <laughs> yeah. You know, the you know the case of if you if you guys are gonna fight, you can you can fight. Just make just make sure no just make sure nobody breaks any hands. Yeah. Yeah. Don't spill any beers. Don't break any hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like. The, like the whole thing of no, of no low blows, no rabbit punches, that that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and of course, or in or in gentlemen's duels, the whole the whole ten ten pa ten paces and the, and then shoot. Yeah. But the big the big reason to have that is so that you can better establish the villain who doesn't who doesn't follow the rules. <laughs> but. When it come now, when it comes to the grimoires, since we're since we're dealing with magic, it'd be very it'd be very tempting for some to put to put in a whole a whole spell list that just <laughs> that just gets overwrought. And from what I've seen, you have you have a you have a short list of effects, but that but that's as that's as far as it goes. Yeah. So there's. Um... When you make a character, you have access to sort of two spell lists, as it were. Uh, one is your grimoire list. That one's going to be ten abilities and one special sense deep. Mm -hmm. And then you have general powers that any witch in the game world might know uh, include, because it's generally that the player characters are grimoire witches, and other witches in the world are not so lucky yeah. uh, to have grimoire powers, though mm -hmm. some do. Um, the more powerful ones, obviously. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you'll have access to that spell list, and then you'll also have access to general powers. And I mm -hmm. think that's only about 33 effects. Um, yeah. Not too bad. Um, kind of fun to look over and, like, sort of see the possibilities of, like, which is playing sports using those powers, and uh, just, you know, which is uh, trying to hold down a day job and making really good use of a particular power like, you know, lesser telekinesis or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, your your real powerhouse spells are coming from your grimoire. Uh, but pretty much every general power kind of has an upgraded uh, grimoire power. So if you wanted to be really very good at telekinesis, then you'd probably go the arcanist route. Uh, but any witch can take lesser telekinesis and do a pretty good job with that. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, we we definitely didn't want to fall into the like, here's a uh, hundred and eighty spells, and here's you know all the spells at this level and that level. Um, that was that was just it was it didn't fit with the way we see witchcraft as witches ourselves in our real lives. Uh, we wanted to see a game that was much more, uh, much closer to how we practice. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that if I end up, if I end up drawing again from the deck that I have, 
inevitably I'm going to end up drawing the magician because it's all because that always I seem to have the that kind of luck. <laughs> no matter the, uh, that card represents the arcanist uh, that we we're just talking about yeah. uh, in our deck. So yeah, huh. and that is actually the second card that was completed for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But um, I suppose I suppose a bet I suppose a better point of com a better analogy I could use is from what I'm seeing is um, a saner, and I say that very 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 loosely, um, <laughs> unknown armies. Hmm. I, I I actually think I would need to take a better look at that and and uh, check out that metaphor. But yeah, interesting. Unknown armies is is do is doing its own spin on modern magic, but um. At, at time at times it at times it's a bit cracked out. <laughs> That's <laughs> that is the best way for me to put it. But I remember what drew me in with with unknown armies was that it was that it had an entire is is that it it made um it had an entire magic style just dedicated to photography. Oh wow, That's cool. Uh. Yeah, so the way we do that is we so in addition to your grimoire that gives you what powers you're specialized in, mm -hmm. you also have... I just lost my train of thought. In Midsons. Uh, casting you, style? Yeah, you have a casting style. <laughs> <laughs> you have a casting style. And your casting style actually uh, tells you, or is what you use to determine how you literally cast spells. And... Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, if you wanted to do it through a camera, you totally could. <laughs> yeah, uh, the game completely uh, would work with that perfectly well. We had a character who uh, was a psyche, uh, so a mind oh, yeah. monitor. Uh, she, yeah, she blew a uh, vape smoke all over everybody to uh, cast her spells. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you can really go at it in, in any direction. The reason we did casting style as separate from Grimoire, so we're not going to tell you, oh, you're playing a Baba Grimoire, you have to do it this way, you have to sacrifice this animal to cast the spell. You can shake or, these bones. Right. We, we never do that in any of our powers. What we do is we say, when you cast a spell using your casting style, this is the effect it has. Mm -hmm. So it's it makes it nice and simple and disconnected. So when you make a character, you and your lore weaver and the other players at the table are going to decide whether your casting style is acceptable at that table. So if you're care, you know, if you say, "Well, I want my character to sacrifice a chicken every time they cast a spell," then uh, a that might make the game uh, real slow. Yeah, real slow. <laughs> it, it might uh, upset some of the other players. It might be it would seen. Be. It would be probably be seen as culturally insensitive. So yeah, there are all kinds of reasons why we want to leave those open. So if there is a practitioner that wants to play the game, that wants to practice their own faith through a character, as long as you're, the other players and your lore weaver are cool with it, we're so happy to see you enjoying the game. Yeah, I um, one of one character that I that I'd made for a, I'd made for a game a, a while back. Um, utilized, utilized, utilized internal magic, but the the means to do it was through eating peppers. Oh. And, um, I, like I was loosely in, I was loosely inspired by two things. One, the way pep the way peppers are crossbred to make it to make even hotter peppers, and yeah. this was days after I lost a bet and I had to I had to eat the Carolina Reaper. Um, Ooh, okay. Pro tip: Don't eat the Carolina Reaper. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do that. I I I think I invented about 15 new swear words because the because I had to eat it, <laughs> and then I had, then I had to survive on one glass of milk for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, after afterwards, I had this I had this big ass gray t gray tub of yogurt that I just I just I just barreled I just barreled through in about three minutes because <laughs> well. well eh. And um, I don't. The other thing that was a bit of an influence on that was reading Mistborn for the first time, and the idea of burning, of consuming and burning metals to for its, for the effects that are used in that particular story. 
and yeah, that sounds like that could work as well. Yeah, I just the I I, yeah the um the the de the control when it came to when it came to that, and because I was being sem I was being semi serious with it, is too too much is for is any is all those peppers are going to be um, more and more painful. Um, after the fact, if you catch my drift, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, like we, the hotness works both ways. That is that is the <laughs> polite way that I will put it. And this is and this was a character who was um, who sometimes after major battles would be on the can for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody had to relieve stress somehow. And um. Afterwards, would walk would walk out and go. Nobody go into that bathroom for the next thirty five to forty five minutes. <laughs> and then somebody would inevitably go in and go. Jesus Christ, what happened in here? <laughs> but and for, fortunately, with some with something like that, it would it. At the time, I had limited to I had limited to to that person using their using their magic to enhance their physical abilities. But I wouldn't be so limited in this particular case. Yeah, uh, the the great thing about it is if the if the player can come up with interesting complications, that, you know, that make a difference in the game, that add depth to the game, then everybody at the table is probably going to love it. Mm -hmm. um, we we've jokingly said that it doesn't matter whether your character you make your character to be very serious or very silly, as long as everybody in the group is cool with the dynamic you end up creating, you're going to have a great time. Because I, yeah. I have done the muscle wizard at, at least once. Because <laughs> one, th one thing I took, one concept I, t I took from Shadowrun because I thought it, because it was my first introduction to this idea is what it does with the concept of adepts. Yeah. You know where yeah. they where they are, they're using magic, but instead of using it externally, they're using it internally to yeah. break the laws of physics. Yeah, I, I loved that too. Um, I I made all kinds of hacks for Shadowrun mm -hmm. to turn adepts into pretty much anything that could could ever be wanted. Uh, I, I even ran a Highlander game using Shadowrun <laughs> uh, at, with uh, adepts as immortals. Oh. Somebody did make a World of Darkness hack called Highlander the Quickening. I remember oh, that, yeah. Uh, and I don't think that system is particularly well suited to that idea, but I digress. Yeah. <laughs> but and it, admit, ad, admittedly um, the com the combination of of those of those sorts of things does does mean that they're that um I'd say if I'd say if there's an, if there's any if there's any habit that would ha that would have to be unlearned by by new stu by new students because I teach people how to play TTRPGs, oh. it is to not it is to not think of the to not think about a spell list, but instead instead think of instead think of your sp your spells the way a the way a character in a kung fu movie is going to think about their fighting style. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually I love that. Um, yeah, that's totally the case. You should, yeah, think of your spells as things you are capable of doing that might or might not have consequences attached. Yeah. So and... yeah, as long as you understand this is something my character is capable of, and you just play your character as a person who is capable of some pretty amazing things, mm -hmm. you're gonna have an awesome time. Which, incidentally. Um, the people who have who have more of a vi who have more of a video game or a or a fi or a film or television background tend to be my best students. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. We've we found that when it comes to learning how to play a Forged in the Dark game, if you come from a really strict combat oriented system like D and D, you end up having a really hard time getting into Forged in the Dark at first. Um, whereas if you get somebody off the street who's never played a tabletop game before, they're going to pick up Forged in the Dark really, really quickly. And it's not because it's a simpler system. It's just because it caters to your desire to tell a story with your actions. Well, and that's 
even, exactly what we're doing. Even be even beyond even when 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 I when I I used I used the thief games to get my, to get some of my students into Blades in the Dark. Nice. Because they're they're both they both have a very similar setting of a it it's very medieval but they but it just happens to have some um electricity. Yeah. But it it isn't it isn't f I've seen some say that Thief is steampunk. It isn't. It's <laughs> it's it is medieval it, that just happens to have electricity in places, mostly places with the hammerites. You know, yeah. who are like Catholics except they don't drink. <laughs> Yeah. But one of I'm I am glad that you put that there is there is the essential essential essentially a mission generator because it's very a problem a problem that can happen and this is a problem that World of Darkness has has suffered through for years is where is where do my players fit in? Yeah. Um Oh yeah, you can read any um, any adventure module, and and just it's like oh my god, our characters are such on they're so on the periphery of these problems. Like they're just being asked to do fetch quests. I mean, we read uh, what was it? We ended up running our own Dark Ages vampire game and read through the uh, Vlad the Impaler uh, three part um, adventure. And it was just, it was so weird to see play, powerful player characters being put on the absolute periphery of problems and say, being told, okay, do this. Now an NPC is going to swoop in and do something cool at the end of that, and your characters are going to learn something. Um, and that's the mission? That That's, yeah. We wanted characters that are powerful and literally change the world. So we want to see people tearing down the order in their campaigns or uh, building up uh, the Vulture Votary or Guy and Guardians. Like, we want to see these factions grow and change in people's games. We want to see if the order tumbles, what rises up in its place. Mm -hmm. uh, to us, that's the most interesting thing. So... In that sort of situation of the order tumbling, I think I, if someone were to ask me what I would what I would do in that situation, I would say, "Well, this is well. Um, it took the it took the assassination of one archduke to kick off the war to end all wars because everybody was doing these this um this spider's net of alliances with each other of if you go to war, I'll go to war with you." So why why not ha why not have a why not have a a witch's civil war in that situation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It one hundred percent could be, and that's the great thing is that you get to make up you get to figure out those things at your own table if that's what you're interested in in doing. Mm -hmm. Now we've seen it happen in our playtests, so we know it's possible. Yeah. Now, one of the stretch, one of the social stretch goals that was unlocked was virtual tabletop support. But yeah. unless I misread, unless I misread, I don't think it's said anywhere specifically as far as which platforms you're going to be you're going to be using. Yeah. So originally, when we put that out there, we were looking at Alchemy, and I've already made some of the tools for Alchemy to be ready for their update. Uh, but we were told about some other virtual tabletops, and being that I am already a computer programmer, mm -hmm. uh, I figured I would probably be able to make the alterations necessary to get it ready for at least a few others. Uh, right now I'm looking at Foundry, and uh, we're still open to suggestions, so we've been asking around on our Discord if anybody, any people have any particular table, uh, virtual tabletops. Yeah. Obviously, that, Roll Twenty is the big ga is the big yeah. game in town, so that that has to be taken into account. But, <laughs> um, and I, and well, there's there's probably some people who who have enough disposable income to use Fantasy Grounds. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't realize it was a relatively expensive. I actually got an email from them today, and I was like, "Oh, that's another virtual tabletop I should check out." 
Well, so. look up Fantasy Grounds Unity on Steam, and you'll see exactly why I make that joke. <laughs> oh, okay. But, and I, and the big reason I, br I bring up that kind of thing is the virtual tabletop scene is fairly competitive these days. There's mm -hmm. no, sh there's, you're not exactly hurting for choice. Um, I my, I myself use, are, am going to be using Roll Twenty in in the future, but that's that's because of what I, that's because it provided the best solution for what I particularly needed, mm -hmm. especially since um, some of the games I'm some of the games I'm planning on I want to run in the future, don't use dice they use cards exclusively. Nice. Um. Stuff like stuff like Dragonlance Fifth Age or Against the Dark Yogi, um, and I know I know some people say Savage Worlds uses cards. That's only for initiative. That doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We use the tarot cards for actually more than uh, what we talked about earlier, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there will be some other tie-ins, but we do not use them for actions. As of yet, there we might end up with some optional rules. Yeah, we've played around. I think we did a fistful of darkness that yeah. way. We've made our own rules for using a tarot deck to play that, and that was a lot of fun. Well, yeah. if, if that approach is taken, if if you're get, you can always steal from the best and just and just take some notes from Everway. Everway, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, spo spoiler warning: the phrase "I'll have to look that up" is get is going to happen a lot, especially if you're dealing, <laughs> especially if you're dealing with me. I I already have three tabs open, and now I'm opening a fourth, and just putting in the search terms mm -hmm. so I don't forget them. Yeah. But with all that with all that said, um, what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window? I know it's I know it says Mar I know it says March on the on the Kickstarter, but it's always something I, I ask because some people just put in a date just put in a date because they have to put one in. No. Yeah, we're we're um so the March twenty twenty four date is for the completion of layout. So that's when the full art, full color, uh hard hardback version of the PDF will be available. Uh, but we're actually looking at October of 2023 for the game to be in a releasable manuscript state. Mm -hmm. So right now we're at about 95% written um, and about 5% on the tarot deck. So we're, we're giving ourselves a good long time before we actually go into print uh, to hit that October 2024 ship date. Mm -hmm. So yeah. We've got uh, several milestones to get to um, before that. Uh, but yeah, the game will be fully play. Well, <laughs> I say would be fully playable. You can grab the kick uh, quick start for free uh, on itch.io. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can actually get started playing it now and then just upgrade to the uh, new grimoire sheets and they'll have some new powers on them and things like that. And you'll have a lot more of a grimoire selection. The quick start has nine, and we're releasing with twenty-two, uh, and with the potential for six more as stretch goals. Yeah, and it'd be really it'd be really funny if you released the PDF on March fourth, just so you could <laughs> say that you're telling people what they're giving people orders. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for our next game, that's thematically appropriate. So <laughs> I will I will consider that date. Yeah, or watch Mar March March. Uh, watch March fourth. So. Six six ships slip silently out to sea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they gotta get some time. Yeah, with, but with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you, thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. And enjoy the madness that that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As Aww. I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> yeah, we did that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, and... thank you so much for having us. We super appreciate it. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. encourage everybody to go check out our Kickstarter. And um, yeah. Mm hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule 
to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!